In this video, you're gonna learn exactly what you need to get started without any of the confusion that so many other teachers suffer when they're just getting started. So to keep this simple and clear, I'm gonna go through five different areas that you need to consider as you're getting started as a piano teacher. So let's get on with it. Hey, it's Tim Topham here from Top Music and I've been helping teachers around the world for the last 10 years to get started as music teachers and really build strong studios, understand their business and really get creative in their teaching. If you wanna find out more about what we do, then make sure you head over to our website, topmusic.co. So let's start with number one. We're gonna talk about equipment. You're gonna need a piano and a bench to sit on, or are you? If you travel to students' houses, then you don't actually necessarily need a really nice piano. And you certainly don't need an acoustic or a grand piano. Even if you're teaching in your own studio, a digital, like I've got next to me over here, is totally fine if you're just getting started. Now, of course, if you are having students come to your own home, then you do need some kind of setup and definitely get an adjustable bench because students come in all shapes and sizes. You're gonna to need to move that bench up and down. Do not get a fixed wooden one. It's a really bad investment. If you wanna find out more, I've got another video on how to choose and the differences between all the piano benches and we'll put a link to it here and in the description below. Now, if you are teaching in your home studio, then you want a minimum of a digital piano with a proper stand, three pedals, preferably a minimum of two, uh, absolute minimum of one to get started and something with a relatively good action. I've got other videos on all the different types of keyboards and instruments which you can check out too, so I'm not gonna go into detail here. But it is super important that when you do start teaching that you get students set up at the right height. So they're not sitting too low, they're not too high. Again, if you want more help on that, I have another video that will talk you through exactly how to get your students set up at the right height. If you are going to students' houses, then you're kind of stuck with whatever they're playing on, but that can be really good. I've taught in students' homes. In fact, when I first started, I was motorcycling. I had my motorcycle, I went around to students' houses, and one of them had this beautiful grand piano. Others had, you know, crummy, wobbly keyboards on stands that really weren't very good. But to get started, you can teach on whatever instrument you, you need to teach on. I've taught and played on all sorts of crummy, uh, upright, digital, electric, synthesizers, all sorts of things. And it's part of the gig. When you're a pianist, you have to get used to playing on all sorts of different instruments. So that's kind of number one. Make sure you've got access to an instrument or if you're teaching in friends or your students' houses, make sure they've got a good instrument. Number two, you need to know what to teach. Now, if you haven't been to a conservatory or a university and you've had your own lessons, then chances are you'll be kind of starting off teaching as you were taught, which oftentimes isn't the best way to go. So the most important thing is that you have an approach to follow. And what I recommend for all teachers of beginner students is my notebook beginners method. This is uh, a super creative approach to teaching beginner piano students without reference to any music or reading or anything like that at the start. It's all about singing and tuning in the ear and improvising and creating. Really great approach to get started with. After that, you'll move to a method book series, which is where students learn how to read music and for that you can go to all sorts of different places my personal favorite is a book called piano safari for uh, children but there are even better options for teenagers uh, and uh, i go into much more detail about teenagers in a course in our top music pro membership academy all about teenagers and the methods and the approaches that i use for them because they're a pretty special bunch methods uh, sorry teenagers and adults. So that second thing, having an approach, a method to use, really, really important. But it also comes down to your mindset. What do you actually want to teach these students? And more importantly, what do they want to learn? Or what do their parents want them to learn? When you're teaching really young children to start with, you probably will be dictating a lot of what they learn because they need to learn certain things about music to be able to play later on. But when you're taking on a new adult student, it really isn't the case. They're gonna be dictating a lot of what they want to do and you need to be able to go with the flow uh, in regard to that. But one of the really important mindsets is that giving students autonomy and helping them play the music that they wanna play, at least as part of their lessons, will really, number one, improve their motivation, it'll improve their rapport, you'll have more fun, parents will be happy, they'll be happy because the kids will go home and wanna play things and wanna practice. So help them play the things that they wanna play. Another approach that I love using is something called four chord composing. I think this should be used by every teacher working with any student because not only does it allow students to explore 
pop song composing with chords, super simple method by the way. Uh, it also gives them a deeper understanding of that harmonic and chordal construction of music. Definitely check out my four chord composing course. We'll put a link in the description below. Okay, number three, you're gonna need some music to play because method books isn't, they're not gonna last you all that long. So what music do you use? Well, you're lucky. Piano music is bountiful. We have too much choice. And really, once you get past the first few method books, it's up to you to understand what direction you're gonna be sending the child or the student that you're working with. Are they moving more towards a competition or exams or festivals? Are they playing more for leisure? Do they wanna move into jazz? What approach are they gonna be taking? So as a new piano teacher coming in, you've got to kind of assess where are they at and where are they trying to go? And that will dictate the music that they learn. However, my one caveat with all of this is whenever you're assigning music to students, make sure you give them a choice. Play them a few, a few selections uh, at the level that they're at. Uh, before they, before you assign something because you want them to have buy-in, you want them to enjoy the music that they're playing. I've only ever been miserable when I've been a student and forced to play something I don't wanna play. It's really not fun. Now, of course, you can't always play everything that you really love, but it's a great starting point for issuing music. Now, if you're unsure of how to go about what level students should be playing at and things like that, then you can use any number of exam boards as references. So most of the exam boards around the world, the AMEB here in Australia, ABRSM in the United Kingdom, Trinity College, ANSCA, there's many, many boards, Royal Conservatory uh, in Canada, publish what's called a syllabus which says that at preliminary level or grade one or level one, whatever they call it, students will be playing a variety of pieces. And here's the list of those pieces which suit that level. It's a great place to start if you're new to teaching to give yourself a bit of a framework for what pieces students should be attempting at that level. Now, there's much more to it than that, of course, and we actually release in our Top Music Pro membership, every two weeks we release a new video all about intermediate teaching. We're playing through through and showing you how to teach the intermediate repertoire. So all of that music between the finish of the method book, whenever that actually is for you and your student, and the start of what they're getting to, the advanced repertoire or the jazz or whatever that is. So we release a video of uh, a teacher teaching with a handout of all of that great repertoire and helping you sort of guide your students as to where they wanna go with it. That's super important when it comes to choosing music. And of course, just be creative as well. Exploring some chord progressions, putting on backing tracks. The student comes in and wants to play a pop song, then try it out. Uh, it's really important as a music teacher in the 21st 22nd, 23rd, whatever century you're watching this in <laughs> to make sure that you are really, really creative and flexible and happy to approach any type of music that student wants to learn. The fourth thing you're gonna need as a new piano teacher is a student to teach. So how do you go about finding them? Well, the first place tends to be for most teachers, word of mouth. Someone is gonna refer someone to you or hear that you learnt music when you were a child and maybe you're a teenager now and they're like, oh, could you teach young Billy next door or whatever it is. So word of mouth is really, really important, uh, but it's not something that you can rely on, unfortunately. And if you're studying as a piano teacher completely unknown, then you're going to need to get your name out there. So it's super important to have a website. And if you haven't built one, then make sure you go and get one created. You can do it yourself. It's actually not very difficult. We've got a course all about that. We'll put it in the description below, step-by-step, step, taking you through how to build a site on WordPress, which is how I've built all my websites. So make sure you've got a website and then popping yourself on free listing sites. There's lots of them around the internet. Music, just search for music teacher listings or music teacher ads. You've got Craigslist, you've got Gumtree, you've got all of these kind of free services is where you can put your name out there for free, at least to start with. Now, if you wanna start getting more serious, then you can look at things like Facebook advertising and how you use social media and those kinds of things. But honestly, when I got started, word of mouth was massive and also some of those free listing sites, just getting your first students like that. And you only need you know five students or something like that to start being able to practice your skills to get better. And then you'll learn a little bit more about the kind of student that you want. Uh, what hours you like to teach, how it all works, and you can start getting more understanding around 
the kind of role that you want to have as a music teacher as that progresses. So looking at your website, free listing sites, and then onto things like social media marketing. Uh, you can also put up flyers still around local community areas. If you're in a smaller community, that still works. Letterbox drops even still work sometimes, or getting your name into primary schools in your area. There's lots of quite effective and quite simple and cheap ways to be get known in your local community in particular. But then of course, we could talk about online lessons where the world is potentially full of your students. And so that's where things like uh, social media marketing and having a strong YouTube presence and also a website that really converts people and gets them encouraged to try an online lesson with you uh, can be helpful. Again, we support and give you guidance on all of these topics inside our Top Music Pro membership. And lastly, number five, you're gonna need to find a way to schedule these students and get paid, hopefully. Now, if you're like me, when you first start teaching, if you're traveling to students' houses, which is often how we begin, you'll probably just get cash after the lesson. And I was okay with that for the first little while, but it's completely unhelpful and not very useful if students quit at the last minute or sorry, they cancel a lesson at the last minute or something like that. You really need to have some studio policies and preferably some payment up front in bulk for a series of lessons. So I strongly encourage teachers to set up automated monthly billing for the students that they're teaching. It is actually really easy. I recommend some software called My Music Staff, which is relatively inexpensive. And in actual fact, all our Top Music Pro members get 90 days of a free trial to set this all up and get started with it. And all you do is get all your new students to enter their details into their system directly. You don't even have to type stuff in. They enter their credit card details and you work out how much that they need to be charged every month for their lessons. And it's a done deal. You don't have to worry about things. Now, when it comes to scheduling and makeup lessons, there's lots of different approaches to this. I really encourage uh, all teachers or budding teachers out there to create makeup lessons. So when a student cancels or misses a lesson, then just create a lesson by video for them. So like a recording I'm doing here, hey Billy, Sorry that you were sick today. Here's what I want you to continue on with. Here's what we were doing last week and off you go with it. And there's various software and tools that you can use to share that. Uh, I quite like uh, one called Lesson Mate, which I did a podcast on. But you can do this quite manually through uh, email or whatever service you'd like to use and putting uh, videos up on YouTube and linking to them, whatever you'd like to do. But I do discourage uh, teachers from offering endless makeup lessons. It just makes an absolute mess of everything, particularly if you are a traveling teacher. It might be easier if students are coming to your studio, but make sure, yeah, you're setting up the automated monthly billing that you've got a really good schedule system uh, and you are looking after yourself with your studio policies. I hope that was a useful quick look at some of the things you need to consider if you're looking to become a piano teacher. Of course, there's heaps more to know and I actually have a whole course on it. It's called the Beginner Teacher Blueprint. We also have a studio roadmap inside our Top Music Pro membership. We'll make sure we put a link to that below. But if you do have any other questions, I'm more than happy to help and jump in as I can. So leave a question or comment below. If I've forgotten anything vital that you would have put in your top five for getting started, then add it below and let's have a bit of a chat about it too. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next video. Make sure you hit the bell icon and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Good luck, everyone.